Well, hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 244 of Goulet Q&A. Today I'm going to talk to you about expanding our rollerball selection, making a nib less wet, and pricing trends in fountain pens. Lots of good stuff here. We've been pretty busy. Surprisingly, you know, the holiday season is usually our busiest time of year. January into February has remained really, really busy for us. So we had a lot going on. We got a lot of special projects that we're working on. Just all kinds of good fun. So I don't know. I feel like I say that we're busy a lot around here, probably because we are. Um, the LA Pen Show is this weekend. I am not going to be there. No one from my team will be. It's clear on the other side of the country. Just couldn't make it work. But um, should be some interesting stuff going on there. I know one of the things, Monteverde is launching a new coral ink there. Um, uh, that's like right in like uh, Yaffa's backyard there. Monteverde is owned by Yaffa and they're based out of LA. So that's kind of cool. That's like their, their local show. Um, but anyway, so we'll have that at some point here soon. Um, yeah, and just in general with shows, I, I'm getting asked on a pretty regular basis, hey, you're gonna be at this show or that show or whatever. I think right now, I mean, DC has been the one it's closest to home for me. That's been the one that I'm going to go to, um, you know, the most often because it's geographically easier. Uh, but uh, so I'll, I'll plan on on making an appearance there this year for sure in August. Um, basically, all the other ones are up in the air for me. I know that I won't be at LA. I know that I won't be at uh, Baltimore because I'll be out of town. Uh, but other than that, there's a lot of stuff that's in the air. So again, I'm not doing. I'm not like. I mean, I did a bunch more shows last year. I'm not like amping it up and doubling the number of shows I did this year. I'm probably going to end up doing fewer just because we have so many projects. But anyway, um, staying somewhat quiet with new products here recently, you know, I was just looking with our team about what we launched in January and it's about half of what we normally launch. Just fewer new things going on around the turn of the year. That's going to start to change here in the next few weeks. Um, once we roll like end of February into March, you're going to start to see some new stuff coming out. Um, we do have a couple new things that we've launched recently, which is always exciting. So we've had some new um, Retro 51 fountain pens, like the P51, the Lincoln, you know, the Black. Some of these things that I, I showed maybe last week and alluded to. Um, but very exciting things, and, and they've been received pretty well. I think Retro 51 is starting to make more of a name for themselves with fountain pens, which is really good to see. That's part of why we wanted to get involved with them. Uh, last year, we saw this potential coming. They got delayed on some nibs, and now they're starting to come in, so that's pretty cool. Um, they also announced their Dimitri and Eiffel rollerballs. So this is the Eiffel Tower theme, and then uh, the Dimitri is the one that has the periodic table on it. So those have been pretty cool, very well received. Um, we have some Lamy Crystal ink samples that we've launched this week. Uh, we don't have the bottles yet. I don't know yet when they're going to arrive. Just have no information on that. So that's, uh, that is what it is, but that's all I got for you. I'm sorry we didn't have enough to launch actual bottles, so we decided to sample up what we had, at least give you some idea uh, of what was available there. Um, and then we have some Valentine's uh, videos that we've launched this week, which have been pretty awesome. I know Valentine's Day is over at this point, um, but you should definitely check them out if you haven't already. Um, and then we do have one kind of exciting thing that we got to launch, um, which is always a new, uh, opportunity for us when we make a connection with another brand. Um, we've done a lot of co-branded, a lot of exclusive type things. We really enjoy doing that. It's a lot of fun. I'm very passionate about doing that personally. Uh, and we have one here. I will not hype it up too much because I don't think we're going to have it for long, but a lot of you have been asking for it for a long time, and that is a collaboration with Franklin Christoph. I alluded to this on my Instagram a couple of days ago, had a nice little black and white photo, a little teaser in there. Some of you nailed it. They were like, that looks like a Franklin Christoph Model 31. Well, you're right. Um, and it is an, an exclusive new color that they actually uh, kind of did up for us. We threw around some ideas with them and they were like, how about this? And I was like, that's amazing. That's exactly what we want. So it is a blue and white and purple swirly sparkly pen that we are calling Cosmic Dust and it's pretty darn cool. So definitely dig it. It's got, uh, it's not uh, super translucent, but it does have a lot of depth to it. It's not like you can see through the pen. It's fairly opaque. Uh, and then Franklin Christoph, it's got their number six Yovo nib on it. Really cool thing. If you're not familiar with Franklin Christoph, a lot of their pens, they do the threads, um, you know, a little bit differently here. They have these kind of blocky kind of threads so that it doesn't, uh, you know, feel hard on your fingers or anything. And then the number six nib, they actually inset it a little bit into here, kind of like the Keras Customs ink, so that it doesn't stick out quite as far. And uh, yeah, just all around pen. Standard international cartridge converter, 
comes with a converter, and uh, we are limited to 100 of them. And I think they are going to fly. So they're 165 if you're interested in that. And uh, there's 175 if you want to get the one with the 1.9 music nib which is an exclusive for franklin christoph so it's the first time we've ever been able to offer it i honestly think that by the time this video publishes a lot of them will be gone so if you are interested in this definitely jump on it like immediately because i honestly would be shocked if we still had them through the weekend so that's just how it goes franklin christoph is limited in their production um it's something that you know we've been aware of each other our two brands for a long time they're doing great. They're growing. They're like every show they go to. If you've ever been to a show, they like sell out of everything they make. They're just at capacity and they do these retail exclusives. They've done them, you know, with a bunch of other retailers. This is our first one with them, but they limit how many they can do. And it's kind of like we get what we get and we don't throw a fit. So it's been great. Scott Franklin's been amazing to work with. It's been a good collaboration. So we're happy to be able to offer this, but uh, don't go thinking that like, oh, you're going to do one every month. Like, no, this is going to be a super limited thing for uh, quite some time. Their pens aren't numbered or anything, um, but it is going to be limited to 100 on this batch. So um, go and pick that up on our site like ASAP if you can. Um, and then we also have the Montegrappa Elmo in black that I think is going to be coming soon. It's not here yet on Wednesday when I'm filming this to be able to show you, so I'm hoping it's going to be here by Friday, but if not, it should be here relatively soon. So this is the same Montegrappa Elmo that we've already had in the red and the green, so uh, it's going to be in a black version now. And this one is going to be um, non-exclusive of ours. This one's going to be available through um, all retailers, so you can just be aware of that. All right, let's get right to the questions, shall we? For pen and writing questions, this one is from Lightly Fluffy on Twitter. Hello, my question is, have you ever considered carrying rollerball pens from brands you already carry? Lamy, Pilot, Pelican, Kaweco, etc. Most of them offer rollerball versions of fountain pen models they make. With Retro 51, do you see bigger rollerball market opening up? Um, so we actually have carried some rollerball pens in the past. Um, specifically, we did Lamy, Safari and All-Star, Pilot Metropolitan, and we actually carried some Pilot G2s as well. Um, because basically when we talked to Pilot, they were like, this is the most popular rollerball in the United States, like of all rollerballs in existence. So you guys should definitely just pick some of these up and try them out. So we did, we thought we sell, you know, the Safari, it's a really popular fountain pen. You know, why wouldn't it be popular in a, in a, in a rollerball version? Same thing with the Metropolitan. The Metropolitan even uses the same refill as a G2. So it's like, why not? Um, I didn't sell this rollerball specifically. This is the French Blue, which kind of matches my Dunder Mifflin shirt here, uh, which I just picked up at Target last night. Anyway, <laughs> so this is a rollerball version of a long discontinued color that they don't have anymore. And, um, you know, this was just kind of the regular old silver metropolitan um, but either way it seems a simple in concept right like there's way more people in the world using rollerballs than fountain pens they're already popular models popular brands seems like if we're going to dip our toes into the water these would be the ones to do it and in truth we did okay like we did okay with some of the brands that were i uh, sorry with some of the models that were new colors like we had a special edition uh, lamy i'm trying to remember which which colors they were that we offered those in. Maybe you all remember. This would have been like maybe four years ago. This would have been four, four and a half, some, something like that, uh, years ago that we were doing these, this rollerball thing. We did it for like nine months, maybe almost a year. Um, and ultimately, we did okay with the special editions and stuff that came out, and then it would just quickly tail off, and we would just trickle sell a few. Uh, and all the regular colors just didn't sell. In fact, we still joke with John Lane of Pilot Namiki because we are, I believe, the only account to have ever returned G2 rollerballs to Pilot USA uh, because we couldn't sell them. Uh, as much as they are popular and as ubiquitous as they are, we couldn't sell them. Just to goes to show that we can't just sell anything. Um, we are very much known for fame fountain pen people and... Um, you know, the rollerball thing just did not translate quite as much for us. So we carried that for forward for the next three years, really. And it wasn't until mid last year when we went to the Atlanta Pen Show, Drew and I were there, and we had sort of a little focus group of sorts um, where we had a bunch of people. We noticed there was like Retro 51 rollerballs, you know, pretty, pretty heavily represented amongst the Pen Show community. And so we were like, 
what is the deal with you all carrying these retro roller balls? Like, how is it that you carry these, but yet anything else is like blasphemy? And they were like, well, the theming or whatever. A lot of people had the very personalized. So a lot of it has to do with the designs of Retro 51, which is very much special to them. Um, the quality of the pen, and then really it just has to be like, you know, the way they write and stuff like that. They say, you know, I'm totally into fountain pens, but for those situations where a fountain pen is not the most ideal circumstance, the Retro 51 is like the one roller ball that I will tolerate. Um, <laughs> not to say you have to tolerate that pen, but you know what I mean? Like, there's very much like a conversion experience that a lot of fountain pen people have, myself included. And, uh, you know, so, going to a roller ball or even to a ballpoint or anything feels like moving backwards a little bit in a way uh, in terms of writing experience. I know that not everybody feels that way, but um, that is the way that a lot of people feel. So the Retro 51 is kind of like, okay, when I need to compromise, this is going to be pretty much one of the best roller balls that I can get. Or what happens is a lot of people will gift that roller ball pen to the people in their life who they want to improve their running experience, but they just don't want to dive into fountain pens and commit. Um, they'll say, say, here's a Retro 51, you'll have a better experience than you would just grabbing, you know, your whatever ballpoint happens to be laying around. So, um, you know, Retro 51 was a little bit of a gamble for us, um, and so we, we wanted to pace ourselves a little bit, and we did, and we're getting more excited with them as we're getting into um, being able to design some of our own stuff, uh, do some more with the fountain pens there, which was really what we wanted to, to get to, and now we're starting to get there, which is pretty exciting. Um, so it's hard to say if there is, like, more of an opening for rollerballs, because Frankly, for us, it just hasn't really played out that way. We are so known for fountain pens um, that we've actually even baked it into our mission statement. In fact, going back to that experience when we started to dabble into rollerballs the first go around in that like 2015-ish time frame, uh, w our original mission statement was to provide writing enthusiasts with the most personal online shopping experience through comprehensive education, exemplary service, and products we believe in. After we dropped those roller balls, we were like, no, we're not going to just expand and spread ourselves out because this is something that very commonly happens with companies. After they've been around five, six, seven years, they start to have some success and they spread themselves too wide. They take on too many opportunities, become jack of all trades, master of none, and they basically become known for being meh in the marketplace for a lot of different things instead of yes for one thing. And we are the yes for fountain pens. And we love being in that place. So that really was just like, we kind of doubled down on that. We actually changed our mission statement from what we had originally. So instead of to provide writing enthusiasts, we changed it to provide fountain pen enthusiasts with the most personal online shopping experience, et cetera, et cetera. So that really kind of locked us in. And that has been helpful to our, um, you know, decision making over the last four years or so since we did that because we've been given a number of opportunities. A lot of people talk about, you know, why don't you get into this or that or the other thing? And I'm like, mission statement, psh, does it bump up against that? Does it fit? No, get out of here. It's not, it might be a great opportunity, but it's not an opportunity for us. Uh, and that has been a super helpful, uh, super, super, super helpful. I cannot stress how important that has been. So um, really the difference there has been with retro, especially, I feel like I have to explain myself for picking up a rollerball. Um, but what happened and what that little, that little um, you know, rollerball intervention was <laughs> in uh, Atlanta last year, uh, it ended up being, you know, yes, we are the fountain pen community and we accept the Retro 51 as a product that we believe in as a fountain pen user. And so we were like, ah, that was the connection. And Drew and I were pretty like anti-retro, anti-rollerball before that. And once we made the connection, we were like, oh, this is the rollerball pen that fountain people will use and find acceptable. That is different. And that's when we changed our mind and we picked up retro. So um, uh, that was pretty much what happened. And uh, what was I going to say? I have one more note in here. Oh, yeah. So fountain pen show going people especially said that's pretty much the only rollerball they'd use. They buy for other people in life. Or... Um, they would buy for people as a, a gateway. You know, the people and family members, friends, whatever, that they thought could get there, but the fountain pens was just too much of a leap. They'd say, here's a roller ball. And once people got kind of hooked on the idea of having a better writing experience, that was then, you know, a little bit easier to introduce the fountain pen. So um, is the roller ball market opening up? The roller ball market is already wide open. Like we are just super niche uh, into the fountain pen thing. There's probably 
I don't know, a hundred times more people using rollerballs than fountain pens, if I got to be real, especially in the U.S. Um, so the rollerball market is already wide open. That's, it's not a matter of it opening up or not. Uh, it's really a matter of are we opening up our focus, and the truth is no. Like, I'm really not shopping around for other rollerballs that we could carry. Um, pretty much unless I get a resounding, like, beating on our doors virtually, <laughs> beating on our virtual doors uh, to carry more specific rollerball products with reasons why, uh, we're not going to hardcore pursue them because we are really the fountain pen people. There you go. All right, Gabriel S. on Facebook says, I have a new Homo sapiens and love everything about it except cleaning. Is there any easy way to speed up the process and how do you know when it's fully clean? Okay, so I have here uh, a, a, a Homo sapiens and I have a clear version of it. This is the Florentine Hills, which is no longer available. I am really in the mood to show you all things that you can't get today. I apologize. It's just, I'm in that mood, you know? So uh, Florentine Hills is here. I normally carry a Homo sapiens with me everywhere, but Andy's currently using mine for a video, so I feel almost naked without it. It's kind of weird, even though I have you know, another one I can replace it with. But anyway, um, so this is the Florentine Hills. This is a demonstrator version, but it will well represent, uh, for whatever purpose we need, that this is a, you know, covers all Homo sapiens, right? So it's really just a vacuum filling pen. If they call it a power filler, um, this one is a double reservoir power filler, but that doesn't matter for this purpose. The cleaning process is exactly the same. So what happens with these vacuum filling pens is you have an empty chamber right here. You have a piston seal that engages when you push it down. So you're creating pressure uh, you know, against the walls of the chamber by pushing the seal. It, it creates a negative pressure behind that seal. And then right when it gets to that point right there, it drops off, it releases that seal, and it causes the negative pressure to equalize. And whatever ink or water or whatever you have going on, it will switch and rush up into the pen. Um, it works out well. Uh, for a filling mechanism, you're able to get a larger ink capacity. It's pretty fun to just pump it back and forth, uh, but for cleaning, there's not really, you can't disassemble this, you can't make it that easy. You can, you can disassemble a Twisby VAC 700R, which I have right here, and that uh, the concept is exactly the same on this pen. It's also the same on the Pilot Custom 823, you know, where as you can see even clearer because there's, there's no other stuff going on. That's what's happening there. Uh, the Twisby one, is a little bit easier because you can, where's my Twisby wrench? There we go. I end up creating a little bag in my drawer with all of my random essentials. So I can just grab the bag. Ta-da! So here's my little Twisby wrench. You go in here, you can unscrew it. You can pull the mechanism out and you can, you can just use a bulb syringe just like you would a cartridge converter pen. So it's super, super easy to clean, right? Blast it through. Technically, you can do the same thing on your Pelican M800. Technically, you can do the same thing on your Pilot Custom 823. Those manufacturers don't love you doing that. So as an authorized retailer, I will say you should uh, think twice before doing that because you may violate your warranty. Uh, Twisby gives you the frickin' wrench. So they're like, go nuts. Um, so you can do that. However, on the Homo Sapiens, uh, it doesn't even have a tool or ability to disassemble that. They're just like, nah, nah, not for you. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> so what ends up happening is the only way that you can really clean this thing is to do this over and over again. You have your water, you fill it up to the grip. So you got to submerge the entire nib into that water and you just got to pump it over and over and over again. And it's tedious, right? Like it's not the easiest cleaning filling mechanism that's not why people regard va vacuum filling pens is because they're so great to maintain, um, but they are pretty fun to pump. Uh, but it does get annoying. I wouldn't recommend probably using this pen as the, I'm going to test every new ink that I get. And I'm going to buy a hundred samples at a time and I'm going to use this as my pen to test it. Mm, maybe you should get a cartridge converter pen and just flush that sucker out with a bulb syringe or get like a glass dip pen or something like I have here. Uh, and you can use that too for sample testing and whatnot. But either way, this is not the pen that I would recommend for changing out your ink colors a lot, unless you really love to clean your pens all the time. 
So a couple little tips and tricks that I've learned from having cleaned this so many times. One is that you can pump it a few times, get the water kind of flowing in and out. Once you pump it and it's full, leave, leave it down, like leave it mostly closed. You don't have to screw the thing down unless you really feel like it, but I don't, because there'll be water inside here. I hold the pen very firmly so that I'm not gonna lose my grip, even with a wet hand, and you just kind of shake it back and forth like this. Doing that will force the water into all the cracks and crevices inside the pen, and that will help to move along the cleaning process. Because when you're carrying the pen around, it's getting kind of sloshed around all over everywhere too. But if you just are going like this, pumping in one single direction, there's gonna be ink like all up back in the back here and everything that is not gonna get cleaned out until you kind of move the pen around and shake it a little bit. So I'll usually pump it a few times, go like this back and forth, pump it a few more times, go like this, pump it a few more times, maybe I'll dump my cup of water, pump it some more. But it takes a solid couple of minutes, especially if you got like a crusted up, nasty, shimmery thing it dried out five months ago and it's like all crusted and dried up on here. That's gonna be a real pain to clean and I'm sorry for you. If you get into that situation, you can go a step further, which is not something that manufacturer even recommends, but I'm gonna tell you what's possible and you can decide for yourself if you wanna do it. Um, but before I get to that, once you get it to the point where you're like, I'm so sick of flushing this, I just wanna see if it's clean, take a wet paper, sorry, take a dry paper towel, take your pen, put the face of the nib onto the paper towel and just kinda of drag it very slowly on there. It'll wick the water out of the pen. It'll wick everything out of here. And if you see any color in that water at all, you gotta keep pumping because there's still ink in there. If you're doing that and it's perfectly clear, that means it's just water going through and that means that you're gonna be clean enough where you can um, you know, go on and use a different color. Now, if you get to the point where it's really crusty and really nasty and you just really wanna get up in there and clean it, you can, on the Homo sapiens, remove this nib unit. Uh, it does have an O-ring in there, so it has a lot of resistance to it and you can bend the nib if you don't know what you're doing. So that's why I don't recommend doing it unless you feel very comfortable uh, doing that and their nibs are not cheap to replace. So um, you basically can grab, you don't wanna grab the wings, you don't wanna grab the tip, but you wanna put pressure between your thumb and forefinger. You can go either way. I know people that do it both. Um, I tend to do it where um, I have my index finger on the top of the nib and my thumb on the feed. I know other people that respected nib people that do it the other way. This is just me because my hand kind of curves with the nib. I tend to prefer to do it that way, but it's totally up to you. Just gently kind of slowly turn it counterclockwise is what I'm doing. It'll have some resistance at first because again, it has that O-ring on there and then it'll kind of loosen up. The O-ring is, is all the way back here in the back um, and it'll get in there. Once you do that, ink usually kind of hangs in around the nib unit. Um, so once this is out, you can take a bulb syringe and you can just put it right on here and you can flush just the nib unit. So that helps a ton. And then you can take water, you can drip it right in here, you can use a Q-tip, kind of swab out the body of the pen, makes it way easier. I don't recommend doing this every time you clean a Homo sapiens because, you know, every time you do it, you're risking, you know, bending the nib, bending the fins, you're risking, you know, offsetting the, the threads with the nib unit and stripping them or doing something crazy. You could lose the O-ring, you could drop the nib down into your garbage disposal you have an element of risk that happens every time you take this nib out of the pen, but that is totally up to you. You are a grown up, maybe, and uh, maybe not. There's kids that watch this show too, um, but uh, you are uh, uh, your own person and you can make your own decisions and live by the consequences. But anyway, now I've at least told you what's going on and you can take that knowledge and carry it forth with you throughout your life. For making decisions about how to operate in society. <laughs> but anyway, that's basically how it's done uh, and what I do. I end up removing my nib not that often, frankly, uh, but I do pretty much keep mid-range blues in my homo sapiens at all times. Cool. Ryan F. on Facebook says, why aren't there more economic vacuum fillers available? I thought this was pertinent you know, coming in behind the Homo sapiens because the Homo sapiens isn't typically referred to as the most economical vacuum filler, though it is often referred to as kind of the grail. Uh, Twisby Vac 700R, which is the version that they have now, 
Originally it was VAX 700, they added the R, changed the O-ring design a little bit. But anyway, same pen, more or less, uh, is by far the most economical vacuum filler. Theoretically, I mean, why couldn't you make a vacuum filler even cheaper than this? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I've never seen one. Maybe I'm just ignorant. So please point that out in the comments if I am just not aware of a less expensive vacuum filling pen. Um, but this is by far the cheapest I know. The next vacuum filling pen I can even think of, um, like a true vacuum filling pen, is the Pilot Custom 823. Uh, and then it goes up to the Homo Sapiens. There's not a ton of them. I mean, there's all kinds of vintage ones uh, that, that are probably out there that would be cheaper, but I'm talking like regularly available today, commercially made kind of pen. Um, I don't know why there aren't a lot of cheap ones. I think it's just because, you know, it's just not that mainstream, right? Um, it's really kind of a specific design. I think there's probably some more, um, engineering and, and exact kind of specifications that are required to make that filling mechanism as opposed to, um, you know, a, a piston or an eyedropper or something like that. Um, but that I, I think that's that probably has uh, something to do with it. And then, of course, whatever material you use, it's got to be super airtight in the pen. Um, it's just it's just a little more complicated to do it that way. And can I'm not going to say it limits your pen design, but it does require a certain um, considerations to be made in your pen design. And I suspect, you know, it just has to do with the complications and the R and D that would be involved. And because there aren't like off the shelf components, you know, that you can buy like OEM components that you can buy for vacuum fillers that I'm aware of, uh, every company that creates it has to basically design it on their own from scratch. So, um, it's not like, you know, where a cartridge converter, you can buy those converters, you know, from, basically the same converter you're getting from a lot of different companies. Um, and uh, so it's not like it's as mass uh, mass available, if that makes sense. Um, but anyway, that's the situation that's going on with that. I don't have any firm, 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 firm answers for you, but I suspect that's what's going on. But I'd love to learn more, so comments. All right, <clears throat> this one is from Apostrophobic on Twitter. What do you use when your nib is, too, or sorry, what do you do when your nib is too wet? This might be sacrilege, but I was wondering if there was a way I could tweak and adjust the nib so it's less of a gusher. I don't have many inks to choose from, and I use mainly watercolor paper for when I draw with pens. Okay, um, so a couple of comments on this. Yes, it is possible to do this to a point. Um, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but yes, it's not something that everybody's comfortable with for sure. Um, we're getting into, um, you know, in terms of nib maintenance and nib alignment and stuff like that. It's it's like the next step beyond a simple alignment. Um, you have to actually do alignment as part of the process of making your nib less wet. Um, and it only comes to a point. You can, you can choke the flow of your nib, but you are still gonna have whatever the nib size is that you have. So if you are, if your nib is just writing way too broad for you, it's not like you're gonna be able to take a broad nib, adjust it, and make it write like an extra fine. That's just not going to happen. You'll end up choking the nib so much that it's just going to stop writing um, before it's going to write a fine enough line to make you happy. So again, there are degrees of how wet and dry you can make your nib, um, but you're not going to change nib sizes, if that makes sense. So again, you're getting into very much experimental territory here. You are very much going to violate your warranties if you mess up what I'm about to show you. So take that for what it's worth. Um, because I have a Twisby Back 700 right here, I'm going to use this one. Um, but of course, if you mess it up and then you say to Twisby, Brian showed me that I can do this, Twisby's not gonna be too thrilled with me. So maybe don't tell them that I told you to do that. Anyway. But I'm gonna show you anyway, I'm just using this pen as a demonstrator type of thing. So, you're writing with it, it's too, it's too dry. What you can actually, sorry, too wet. What you can do is you can grab your loop, ta-da, and you can actually take your, actually I shouldn't even show you that loop. That's a different loop than what we sell. That's a 15X loop and we sell the 10. So let me show you the 10. The 15X one has a little, a little housing on the edge of it, doesn't really do much. But anyway, this is the one that we carry, the Carton 10X loop. Okay, so you look at it, and you can look at just the face of the nib, right? So you can look at that and you look, what you're looking for, and I'm gonna have to paint a picture with words here because since I can't really show you close up, I would need like a super macro lens and I just don't have that right now. So um, what you're looking for is the slit 
of the nib going from the breather hole all the way to the tip, you need to see a very, very slight taper to the point where it's up for debate whether it should actually touch or whether it should not touch. It should basically be to the point where it's almost touching. So, I mean, we're talking such a, such a small amount here of taper, but that is going to do um, the best to help promote capillary action. So here I've got a slight taper. It actually does touch at the tip a little bit, and that's fine. Um, it can definitely do that. And uh, in this instance, where the tip's actually touching, there's not really anything I can do to adjust that because the tips are touching. I can't make them touch more. Um, you know, any more that I would try to bring this in, I, I would know that I would cause flow issues with the pen. So that's the first thing to do is to check the alignment. Without a loop, it's pretty hard to do that because you can't really see with your naked eye what's going on here. So you need some kind of magnification. So you look at it and you go, okay, is the tip touching? The best way, it's hard to tell when it's inked. When it's uninked, you can hold it up to a light, like have a light source behind it. It makes it easier to see all the way through it, you know, and then you can see, okay, there is light coming through the tines of my nib. I know I'm in pretty good shape here uh, to be able to adjust and make it a little drier. If the, if the tines are touching, you can't adjust that anymore without causing problems. So if they are apart, then you know you have the ability to adjust the flow a little drier, if you so choose. So the way to do that is um, you take the nib and you hold it so that the face of the nib is pointing up towards you. So hold it in your less dominant hand. Uh, for me, is my left hand. And I, I look at it just like this. And I take my thumb, and just with my thumbnail, I press down on one tine at a time. First, I'm gonna start with the right tine, and I'm just gonna push down on it so that it goes just slightly down and maybe a little bit under the left tine. So this is the right tine, this is the left tine. I'm gonna push it, and I might wanna hear a little click. I'm not hearing a click on this one, and then I'll flip it around and I'll go the other way. Okay, there you go, you can hear that click. There you go. When I'm making that click, that means I'm kind of bending it down and a little bit over. I'm kind of crossing the tines. You know, if, if, how, do I, how do I represent this? <laughs> by, my, by my tines, I'm kind of going like this, boom and boom, okay? And then I check again. I check the alignment, you know, I check to see if it's tightened it up. Of course, I'm not on here because they're already touching. But if that was the case, you would do that a couple of times until it's able to basically kind of bring them in a little bit closer. Now, this isn't the only way to adjust the, the tines of the nib like this, but it is the simplest way um, to talk about it here. You can yank the nib out. You can do different things where you like bend the wings and push down and do other things. That's getting to kind of a more advanced place than I can really show you here, but that is another technique that that nibmeisters will use um, to do that. If they don't want to like put pressure against the feed and stuff like that, they want to pull it out. That's totally legit. Um, but I think it's easier just for demonstration purposes to show you how to do this uh, on the pen. Okay. Once you've done that, you have intentionally basically misaligned your nib. You got to align it again. So you take your pen, just like you're going to stab yourself in the face and you want to look at it and make sure that your tines are aligned. This one, my right tine is a little bit low. So I'm just going to adjust it. And basically you just take your thumb, your thumbnail, grab it and you push up. You over, go past the point where you need to and then bend it back and you check it again. And half the time you'll do it and you'll be like, oh crap, I went too far. Okay, let me go back down, let me do da, da. And this is really all nib alignment is, is where the heck is this thing trying to go? Uh, uh, uh. No, wait, too far, go back the other way. And then you go, oh, okay, now it's where I want it to be. Okay, and then voila. They are aligned again. I would put it to paper, check it, feels good. Sometimes you'll do it and you'll be like, that feels like I could cut a steak with it. And then you wanna check your alignment again because you may have done something crazy to your nib. And that's where it gets into the rabbit hole where you're like, I did everything that Brian said and now my nib is scratchy and terrible and it doesn't flow well. That's because you may have done something inadvertently that has now made your nib worse. So. You are definitely taking your li nib's life into your own hands when you start to do this kind of stuff because honestly what happens when I do that and I do something wacky, there's like a whole series of other steps I go through to check to see what it is that I may have done and I can correct them but it may take some time and I'm recovering more than what I can cover just in this one question. So just understand, you know, you don't want to take your brand new homo sapiens, try this, jack it all up and be like, I'm not happy. 
because you did it with Homo sapiens. Try it out with like a Lamy nib or something like that, or a Jinhao or something as maybe your first one if you're just trying it out. Um, but again, you're only gonna be able to dry it up but so much, so just keep that in mind. But at least theoretically, that is how it works. All right, I got a troubleshooting question. This is from Rob Bob 74 on Twitter. What does it mean if you have a nib that repeatedly gets fiber stuck in it? Um, well, first thing is it means you've been using your pen. So good job, Rob Bob. Um, <laughs> the Rob Bob Law blog. Anyway, anybody remember Bob Law Law from Rest of Development? Yes, anyway, Rob Bob kind of reminds me of that. Good job, Rob Bob. So this can happen for a couple of reasons, the whole fiber in the pen thing. Um, one thing it could mean is you just have really fibrous paper. And as you're using it, the, paper, the pen is just kind of collecting those fibers. And now you have a fibrous nib. Um, not ideal, but we'll talk about that more in a second. Um, it could also mean that your nib is scratching the paper. You may have fibrous paper or not, but it could mean that you have a slight burr um, left over from the manufacturing process uh, on the nib itself. Ideally, you shouldn't have that, but it's possible. It could mean your tines are misaligned and maybe one tine is kind of dragging where it shouldn't. Uh, or it could mean that you are pressing too hard and you're kind of forcing uh, that indentation into paper and it's then therefore um, picking up paper fibers as well. Um, so all of these could be possibilities. Um, what's going to happen is the fibers are going to kind of collect and gather up in your nib and either one of two things is going to happen. Um, usually kind of the first thing that happens as it collects those fibers, those fibers end up kind of acting a little bit like a wick and it almost kind of turns your fountain pen nib into sort of a felt tip. Uh, so you end up with these fibers that end up spreading your tines a little bit because you're basically forcing fibers in there to spread your tines a bit. And those fibrous papers are, are absorbent and they're gonna hold some of that ink on the end, especially when it's flowing wetter once you've opened up those tines and you end up with kind of like this felt tip thing. So it's gonna write a little bit wetter, it's going to gush more, it's going to write broader and things like that. It's gonna look just kind of like smushier. It's not gonna be as defined of a line. It's gonna end up like looking just more like a felt tip micro, frank frankly. Um, and then eventually what's gonna happen is those fibers are gonna get like worked up into the pen or you'll have the pen sit for a while, they'll kind of dry out and then they'll start to actually cause problems and impede the flow of the pen. So fibers in your nib are really not great. It doesn't happen like with everything, um, but certainly some of these causes I just listed could be the reason for that to happen. And you're gonna know because your pens either gonna all of a sudden start to write really wet or eventually it's going to start to write really, really dry. So you gotta clean that stuff out of there. If it's not too bad, just regular cleaning and maintenance should help. But if you're in a situation where like you've had a scratch or you've had something where it's like really dug up paper fibers and like jammed them up into that nib, just flowing water through it's not gonna be enough to get it. And that's where this little sucker comes in. This is a brass sheet, um, 0 0.03, is it 0 0.03 or 0.05? I need to check, I think it's 0 0.05 actually. Let me check just so I am not wrong. Gosh, it's been so long since I've really thought about the actual dimension um, that I've got to check it on my own website, but I won't be wrong. I'd rather be right than seem smart. 0 0.002 inches thick. Well, I was way off. 0 0.002 inches thick. It's quite thin, I mean, it's rather thin. Thin enough to get in between the tines of your nib. The reason um, that we sell brass ones is because brass is a softer metal than both gold and steel. So ideally, this will mar and get damaged before your fountain pen nib would. Now I will say, these have some sharp edges on them and if you are like just going nuts and scratching the surface of your nib, you can end up with some fine scratches. That can happen, um, so don't do that. But uh, still, you're not gonna like bend your nib as you're trying to do this. This thing will malform before the nib will. Um, and the process is relatively simple. Say I've been writing for a while. Oh my gosh, I can like see fuzzy stuff sticking out of it. I'm like, okay, that's not great. So ideally you wanna do it from the underside so that you are not um, potentially scratching the surface of your nib, but of course there's a feed in the way. Um, so you might not be able to do but so much there. You can try just doing the underside. You really just kind of work it in there you know, pull it through like that. If you want to, it helps if you start back at the breather hole if your pen has one. Not all pens do, like Lamy for example. Um, kind of work it down and then just work it through like so.
So again, underside I'll usually do it because most of your paper fibers are going to be right at the tip there. Um, but if you have to, you can start from the back, work your way down. That will not only work out any burrs and things like that that may be left over, just very, very fine stuff that could be left over from um, the manufacturing process when they originally cut the slit, um, but it's going to get those paper fibers and stuff out of there too. So brass sheets, if you're using your fountain pens a lot and you've ever noticed you're having flow issues or you're using varying kinds of paper, especially not like fountain pen friendly smooth paper, but like just inkjet paper, thick stuff, um, uh, I would recommend maybe trying a brass sheet. It's a good thing to have in your kind of pen arsenal if you want to kind of keep your experience optimized. Cool. All right, business questions. I got a couple questions to round us out for this week. One from Charles K on Facebook. Will you carrot pilot vanishing points with stainless steel nibs? So all the ones we have have gold nibs. Unfortunately, no, not for the foreseeable future will we have the stainless ones. That seems to be a Japan only offering from what I understand. I don't know if they're available, excuse me, elsewhere in the world. But from what I understand, it's Japan only. And they have a number of different products. Um, seems like a bunch of the Japanese brands keep, you know, a lot of their products only in Japan and they sell fewer things outside of Japan. It's not super unusual. It's, it's somewhat practical, but um, of course we want what we want when we want it, right? Um, so if we see it available, we're like, why can't I get that? It's cheaper. I like the form factor of the pen, but I don't need the gold nib. I don't care about that. Well, I'm sorry. I don't have any options for you there. If I had my choice, I would carry them. And I've given them that feedback multiple times. I'm like, it would be great to have the stainless option, but they just aren't wanting to do it. So, um, you know, as an example, since this is, seems to be the show of things that you can't have, um, I do have a couple of vanishing points. Not that I have stainless steel nibs on them, but um, these are the ones that I'm gonna use for demonstration purposes. Um, this is the brown and green carbonesque which is not a, a US pen. So uh, same concept as the regular vanishing points, um, but really the only difference between the gold and the steel ones is that this little bit, this little nib right here is made of stainless steel instead of gold. Now the gold has a little bit of spring to it and it's a nice writing experience, um, but it, it's, it's a small nib, it's a short nib, so it's not going to be like the most crazy earth shatteringly different experience between the two. Um, so, I honestly, though, I've never written uh, with the stainless steel one, if I have to be honest. But these are not super springy, super crazy ones. I've heard good things about the stainless um, vanishing point nibs. Uh, I've never used both to compare for myself. Um, but anyway, I have to only make assumptions since, again, I can't get them much easier than you can. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. Cool. Christopher M on Facebook to finish us out. Have you seen price trends relating directly to the popularity of fountain pens, supply and demand, or more to factors such as the manufacturer location with given import taxation, pen, nib, and component material? What do you see as the most influential and governing cohort for pen pricing? Some very formal words here. I'm gonna take a sip of water and then tell you the answer, Christopher. Christopher also had a follow-up question asking about the Monteverde Regatta Sport Allura which I'm going to show you in a second. <clears throat> so there may be some factor popularity, but um, you know that could affect it maybe in different ways. I think it affects it like a over the long, long haul. But honestly, from my experience in the pen industry, most of the manufacturers are not looking and being like, oh, it seems like we could make more money on this pen if we just charge more. Let's just jack up the price and take more money from these suckers. Certainly that happens um, in a lot of industries and there may be some of that happening with certain brands. Um, most of those that it tends to happen usually happens over a long period of time. It's not like you'll see fountain pen prices like fluctuating like this. I mean, you'll see retail individual retailers that'll discount and have clearances and new things and old things and all that. Um, that could affect pricing, you know, within a certain degree. But generally you're not seeing like prices jack up or go way down you know, that drastically, um, other than just like, there's a special edition, it comes out, it's hot, there's kind of the last few of them, a retailer's trying to clear them out, they'll discount the price to close them out. That kind of thing can happen a little bit, that that maybe could be considered popularity and whatnot, but from the manufacturer side, they're not saying, oh, well, we know blue is more popular, so we're gonna come out with a blue, whatever, that's a bad example, we're gonna come out with a blue Lamy and we're gonna charge $10 more because we know people will want blue more. That's not really how it goes. There tends to be a lot of consistency within the fountain pen uh, manufacturer side of things anyway. Um, I think there's some, there's some relationship there, like 
a lot of times what will happen is if there's something that's really popular and a manufacturer has a hard time getting supply of something um, or you know they have to go through extra effort to manufacture a certain supply of something and it ends up costing more or they have to ma manufacture it within a certain time frame or there's a tool that breaks in order to be able to manufacture that that kind of stuff ends up happening but honestly you know we're in a niche industry here you know a lot of times what happens is with new pen models especially there's r d costs there's tooling costs and other things there's branding and a lot of that just kind of like these upfront fixed costs that happen whenever they launch any pen model if it ends up being kind of a flop then they usually lose money or they don't make a lot of money um, but uh, and so the price has to be kind of high and sometimes you'll run into this with brands where you'll see a pen that comes out and it's like it's a new model from an existing brand and you're like why is it so expensive it's because there's a lot of r d and other costs that have gone into that and it's like if it ends up selling really well over time, those costs can get spread out over more pens. But if they don't sell that many pens, all of the mold costs and you know tooling costs and research and development and marketing, branding, advertising, all that kind of stuff, distribution, all of that has to get baked into fewer pens. So they use you know depending on how how much a manufacturer wants to invest in developing a certain new line, and what payback period they're expecting and what the R&D costs were, um, that can affect the price. Um, that's not really a supply demand type thing, except there is a little bit of a cart before the horse kind of relationship. If a pen is overpriced, then the chance of it lasting a long time to sell a lot of pens and spread out those costs is lower, right? So there is a lot of interesting things that has to happen from behind the scenes, but honestly what happens a lot more is um, people that are in the industry, like us retailers, we have an awareness of like about pen, where pens should fall based on everything else that's available and what you know price sensitivity there is and all this kind of stuff and so manufacturers will have an idea for a certain pen and if it ends up where they can only manufacture it and it has to be at a certain expensive price then it's like they just won't make it because it won't be practical you know what i mean um they're not going to have you know some slightly different version of a pen that costs 200 dollars more it's probably not going to sell that well unless there's something really really special that goes on with it um, you know, the, the market will just not bear that cost. So they just won't make it. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of conversation on the manufacturing side of where is this pen supposed to sell at? Where's the market for this? What other comparable pens are out there? And do we think that we can make the pen economically enough to fit within where we think you all, the, co the, the consumers, if you will, um, will, uh, we'll be able to bear that price and find it interesting. So there's a lot of that back and forth and conversations that go on. That's a lot of where the manufacturers are asking their distributors uh, locally in their different regions where that will make sense or retailers, individual retailers, they may ask that as well. Um, and so that's, that's more where it goes in. And then some of the price fluctuations you see, especially across the world on given pen models, have to do with currency fluctuations, taxes, duties, tariffs, um, shipping costs, all those things that are more localized, those become factors as well and can affect pricing uh, for sure. Um, uh, and then sometimes what I see is, is more like incidental factors at play, um, like a shortage of certain material, parts, labor, you know, sometimes with certain brands, you know, if they're making some specialty type of thing, there's some certain like plating that needs to have, this is one of the most common things is like either nibs or plating or something like that, where it's a more specialty part of the pen um, that needs to happen that has to be outsourced or provided by a, a third party, um, you know, company. Um, if that third party reaches their capacity or goes under or changes their process somehow, that can affect the price of a given product. So you might see prices of certain things jump up here and there because there was some environmental regulation that happened in Europe that affects the electroplating that was used for whatever given pen. And now all of a sudden it costs three times more to get something electric plated, boom, price has to go up. So uh, there's more of that kind of stuff that drives um, the prices that happen on most pens than anything else from what I can tell. Um, and then, you know, what I've seen sometimes is like something like Pilot Roshizuku um, they have the, the really nice bottles, you know, um, yeah, like this one, the Compeki right here. So they had these nice handmade bottles when they first came out with it. Um, the ink was $35 MSRP and, um, you know, it sold reasonably well. It was definitely a premium ink, but popular ink. Um, and what happened is once they hit a certain scale, a certain volume, 
they were actually able to invest in more machinery and equipment and stuff like that to better mass produce the bottles, which actually caused the price to go down. So the fact that there was increased demand got the manufacturing um, process to a point where they were able to get um, you know, the costs down quite a lot. I think that actually is what uh, is more impacting in the fountain pen industry because the, really the whole industry is pretty small in terms of manufacturing in general. You think about like how many, like uh, I've watched like episodes of how it's made and stuff like that. And you think about like how many radiators and car door handles and you know paper clips and, and stuff like that that you like don't even really think about, but you're like, oh yeah, that stuff is everywhere and you look at the manufacturing facilities for things that size and then you look at a fountain pen manufacturer and you're like oh there's 25 people that work at this company like it is an insignificantly small industry um, so oftentimes what happens is prices are high because it's so manual and so you know there's just no mass produced equipment to invest in because you're not selling millions and millions and millions of things you know like you are with like a ballpoint pen that can be 10 cents um, they're selling, you know, 8 billion of them or whatever. Um, that's just not the case in the fountain pen industry. So like, you know, for the case with uh, Pilot, they were able to mass produce their bottles and actually lowered the price ongoing. So now um, we used to charge $28 a bottle and now we charge $20 a bottle. So pretty significant cost. And a lot of that was just because of the glass, the bottle and the production around it. So there's that. Um, and then last thing, let's take a look at the Regatta Sport Allura. So this is a Monteverde pen, um, magnetic cap. It's a pretty sizable pen, pretty hefty. Um, we've actually done surprisingly well with this pen. We carried it several years ago. It did kind of okay. We dropped it, um, brought it back when the Northern Lights last year came out. That was pretty popular. Um, and then there's a rose gold. There's um, uh, this version, the Allura. And so they're coming out with some interesting things on the regatta and it's been pretty well received. So I'm, I'm kind of glad to see because it is a pretty cool pen. It's heavy, it's a little fat, so it's not gonna be for everybody, but if you like this style, it's gonna be pretty good. So this is the Regatta Sport Allura. Uh, it's all metal. Um, I'm still trying to find out exactly what metal it is on here. In fact, let me see if I've gotten an answer to that because I just asked recently. He's checking. Okay. So I don't have an answer for that yet, but we'll put it on the product page once we know. It's either like a brushed aluminum or a brushed stainless steel kind of thing. And it's not um, like a like a slick glossy coated on here. You feel the brushing. So if you like that brushed metal texture, it feels sort of like the brush texture you would feel on like a Lamy 2000 grip or on the Lamy Studio stainless steel. If you're familiar with either of those, it's slightly brushed texture. You feel it uh, on there. The grip itself is a little bit smoother. It's more of a matte finish as opposed to a brushed finish. Um, and then it has these carbon fiber rings in the middle of it. Classy looking pen. It's nice. It's very like very gray toned, very much like a, um, you know, like a desaturated photo where, you know, there's variation in the colors, but it's all very neutral. Um, so that's pretty cool. I'm kind of digging that. Um, it's a bit of a heavy pen. It's a little bit back weighted. So a lot of you might find it more comfortable like this, but it just got such a crisp, like clack when you, when you cap it and uncap it. Um, very satisfying. Has a number six nib, stainless steel. Um, ours have Bach nibs on them. Most of them have Monteverde nibs, um, which are not Bach. And then it's a standard international cartridge converter, and it has a threaded converter, so it's nice and locked in there. Not eyedropper convertible, but that's okay. We'll forgive that. Um, yeah, I don't know what else you want to know about this pen. Pretty reliable writer. Um, extra, what nib sizes can you get on this one? I forget, but um, I think it's extra fine through broad, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, so there you go. We got a Sport Allura. Let me check real quick the... Um, $80 is our price for the pen, and it is indeed extra fine, fine, and medium. Sorry, there is no broad. I misspoke. That's why I check. Anyway, there's so much information there, it's hard to keep it all locked into my head these days, but I do my best, and you all will forgive me in the 54th minute of Q&A, right? All right, that's all I got for you this week. My question of the week today is how do you hold your pen? And specifically, I'm thinking about what angle. Do you hold it at what I would consider to be a high angle, like above 45 degrees? I'm talking if you have the paper here. You have the paper here and your pen is like this. Do you hold it at an above 45 degree angle, pretty much at 45, or a low angle below 45? 
I'm kind of curious, really just for no other reason than I'm curious. So let me know how you typically hold your pens, or maybe you might vary it up depending on the pen. Uh, maybe you're just an agent of chaos and you like to mix it up. So that's what I'm curious about this week. You can check out a lot of what I talked about here on GoulaytPens.com, though probably half of what I mentioned here is stuff you can't even get here. So that's how it goes sometimes. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great weekend, a great rest of your week, and right on. Thank you.